to start by welcoming everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Nicole, a continuing education coordinator for the Collaborative for Accountability Improvement. And thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, just a few things. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function and we will answer questions throughout or at the end, depending on the question. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, please make sure to share it with attorneys and others within your networks. We would love to continue to spread the word. I would like to start by introducing today's moder moderator, Caitlin Harrington. Caitlin is a physician attorney in Seattle who spends a portion of her professional life as a practicing internal medicine doctor and a portion working on communication resolution program focused projects with Sweet Law and us at the Collaborative for Accountability Improvement. So thank you, Caitlin. And with that, I will pass it off to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Nicole. And good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to the second in a four part webinar series focused on exploring the perspectives of those involved in medical malpractice litigation. The series is brought to you by the Collaborative for Accountability and Improvements Attorney Alliance. And over the course of four months, we'll include conversations with clinicians, attorneys, patients, and families. In today's webinar, I am excited to welcome our panel of attorneys, Liz Leadham, Wes Butler, and Jeff Catalano, who will share their experience of the malpractice process. In the next hour, they will explore potential barriers to the implementation of communication and resolution programs, as well as creative ways in which these barriers can be addressed through adequate legal representation, a balance in expectations, and through the creation of a culture of transparency in the healthcare sector. I would like to make special note that in sharing the perspective of, of attorneys with you, I know that all panelists would agree with me that is what is most important is best supporting patients and families who have experienced medical harm. I am now honored to introduce our three panelists. I will start with Liz. Liz Leadham is an experienced trial attorney who has represented hospitals, physicians, and other providers in medical malpractice cases for over 33 years. She has special expertise on cases involving obstetrics, neurosurgery, anesthesia, and emergency medicine. In addition to her work with healthcare providers, she has represented medical device and product manufacturers. Liz has tried over 65 malpractice cases to verdict. She is regularly selected to super lawyers, top 50 women lawyers, and best lawyer lists. She also serves on the UW Medicine Oversight Committee for the Collaborative. Liz, a very warm welcome. Next, we have Jeff. Jeff Catalano is a partner at Cash's Law Firm in Massachusetts. He represents victims of catastrophic injuries resulting from medical malpractice, auto and bike accidents, construction and property accidents, and food poisoning. Jeff has spoken on patient rights and medical legal issues statewide and nationally. He has also testified before the Massachusetts State Legislator on Consumer Justice Legislation and helped create an innovative medical negligence law. Jeff is past president of the Massachusetts Bar Association. He also serves on the board of the Massachusetts Alliance for Communication and Resolution Following Medical Injury, which seeks to facilitate disclosure, apology, and compensation, as well as on the board of directors for the collaborative. Jeff, thank you for joining us. And we, have, and we also have Wes. Wes Butler is a healthcare attorney based in Lexington, Kentucky. His law practice focuses on advising healthcare providers on regulatory, accreditation, and legislative matters that implicate safety, quality, and reimbursement. In the earlier part of his career, Wes served as a litigation attorney, handling a variety of civil defense matters in federal and state courts. In 2004, Wes was appointed by the Kentucky governor to serve as chief litigation counsel and later general counsel for Kentucky's health cabinet. He served as lead counsel for the state's OIG and Medicaid agencies and was the cabinet's chief legal liaison with CMS and the federal OIG. Wes's time at the cabinet caused his legal practice to shift towards regulatory matters when he returned to private practice in 2007. He continues to be involved in litigation pertaining to healthcare, regulations, patient safety, and health policy issues. Wes, a very warm welcome. I would now like to turn to the initial portion of this webinar in which we explore how an institutional culture of transparency, as well as a balance and expectation for all participants, is necessary to ensure a successful communication and resolution program. Wes, I'd like to start with you. 
With your extensive experience in regulatory matters, we would welcome your thoughts on the need to create an institutional culture of transparency for issues surrounding medical error. How best can this be accomplished? Great. Thanks, Caitlin, and uh, glad to be with you, Jeff and Liz. And as always, uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to join everyone through the collaborative and the great work that they have. Uh, uh, I can never um, express uh, deeply enough uh, how great it is to have an organization that uh, advocates for these types of conversations because it, I think it ultimately le uh, leads us all down a better path. Uh, but uh, thank you for the question. Kind of turning back to your point, uh, or the question that you raised was uh, creating an institutional culture of transparency. I, I think it might be good to kind of start out a little bit. You gave a bit of my background, but uh, I thought it might be good to maybe give a little bit of context from an organizational standpoint. I had started out in my practice from a litigation perspective, uh, serving my clients in the particular ends that they were desiring, and then moved effectively as an in-house counsel back at the cabinet. And that was the first opportunity I had to really give uh, what I would say a concerted uh, effort uh, and thought towards what it means to have uh, a, an organizational ethos, uh, trying to figure out exactly what, what our institutional goals were, and ultimately what the kind of culture it is uh, we were trying to develop within our organization. And fortunately, I had the opportunity, my, my boss, my, my, uh, uh, the secretary of the cabinet, was a three-star brigadier general, and he brought a lot of uh, uh, organizational leadership tools to the table and really got me first thinking about my role as counsel uh, to an organization and it kind of developed me in thinking through some of these issues on a deeper, deeper level. And that kind of segues into the, the question about institutional culture and particularly with transparency and medical error. I mean, all of this brings to a head uh, very serious issues, very serious concerns that at least from my perspective, and, and I'm not uh, a medical liability attorney, uh, most of my work is trying to prevent the things that come to medical liability from the safety and quality side. So I'm trying to work with uh, the organizational processes. But as part of that, uh, I've had the, the good fortune of working with organizations to sit down and try to, to, to suss out exactly what type of institutional culture uh, could, could, uh, we were trying to seek or trying to achieve. So with that, uh, through the experience that I've had with several of my clients, I, I jotted down a couple of ideas of an approach uh, that I feel has worked with several clients, and I thought I'd maybe touch upon them there uh, for here. Uh, first and foremost, um, I think it's important that uh, when I'm meeting with an organization that we have an agreement as to what we mean by even having an institutional culture, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, an organization's underlying beliefs and values represent its culture. And it's what I often talk about as being the non-negotiables for the organization, the things that hold true for the organization. And when we just simply look at that question, the first question we think of is, you know, what exactly does my organization believe and what are its values? And when we look at that question, uh, when we step back, we notice a couple of things in particular. We notice that's a broad question, it's a deep question. And from those two components, we recognize that it's a very important question. So when I work with organizations and trying to discuss the, uh, the uh, organizational or institutional culture, my very first goal is to simply make sure that the organization uh, appreciates the import importance of culture and understanding what it does for the organization go on. And that seems like a very basic step, but I don't skip it uh, because uh, when I was counsel, I often skipped over that step because my job was to get to a particular goal. You know, it was to settle the case, work the case. And now I recognize from an organizational standpoint, it's under, you have to have a real direction that's going to address some of the hard, uh, harder questions that come about. So that's the first point. The second point is once we have identified that there is an appreciation for culture, uh, then we want to examine exactly what that means to them. So I thought I'd start with a very short, brief exercise. And I'm going to ask just a few questions, and I'm going to pause and allow people to reflect on their answers to those questions. And uh, your answers aren't meant to be shared. It's just for you. But just to kind of think about uh, these, these questions and how you would answer them. So the very first question is, are you able to summarize in a sentence or two what your organization's values and beliefs are when it comes to medical errors? So think about that question. 
So if so, second question is, does the organization that you're with always act in a way that reflects these beliefs and values? And the final question, as you've thought through your answers to those, did your answers to either of these questions make you feel generally encouraged or discouraged? If, these, uh, if your answers to these questions caused you a little bit of discouragement, I say, you know, don't lose heart. Um, uh, that's precisely what the effort of going through and considering your organizational culture is intended to do. It's intended to make you feel a little uncomfortable to figure out exactly whether you believe in or you have beliefs and values that you can articulate and hold. But if you are uncomfortable, then it's usually a point where you want to say, okay, well, why is that? So from my observations, I've identified two common uh, sources of discouragement when it comes to how organizations examine their, their culture, particularly towards medical errors. And these are gonna be kind of summary in fashion, but uh, one particular obstacle or source of discouragement uh, tends to be that the organization's culture towards patients generally and unintentionally can become superficial. A second point uh, that I've found is that there is sometimes a failure to plan, and that's where an organization's operations do not necessarily reflect or support that organization's commitment uh, to how it views its beliefs and values towards patients in medical error circumstances. And both of these obstacles or these sources of discouragement uh, can sometimes be hard to diagnose in an organization, but they tend to be revealed under stress and under scrutiny. And that's why it's important to kind of to, to step back and think through some of these issues. So let me touch upon both of these very briefly. And, uh, and then I want to come back to the point of transparency. Uh, first, when I talk about superficial culture, what I generally mean is uh, where you've got a cultural statement, uh, a belief, a value that you're promoting uh, to the public and saying, this is who we are. If that statement becomes more aspirational or inspirational rather than operational. Something that sounds really good in a slogan, sounds really good in what you're communicating, but might have some difficulties in articulating exactly how that plays out. And occasionally what I'll discover is that uh, sometimes these uh, organizational statements that are intended to communicate the culture of the organization, you know, particularly in, in a medical era circumstance, what it's really doing is communicating a pathos, uh, a, a passion or an emotion rather than an ethos, which is more of a character and credibility that you're really hoping to communicate. And unfortunately, the slogan becomes the focus more so than really what the slogan was intended to represent uh, in the first place. So superficial cultures are, are something that have to be uh, always cautioned against. The second obstacle deals with failure to plan, and, and this one can sometimes be related to the superficial culture, uh, but it can also be just related to the failure to, to think through how a culture uh, ultimately it reaches the patient in a, meaningful, uh, in a meaningful way. So this can even happen with a well-considered culture. And, you know, and typically what I say is once an organization discerns and articulates its beliefs and values regarding medical er errors, uh, it must then test those values and beliefs and see how they actually work in real, in real circumstances. And then you need to be asking yourself some questions. Uh, do these values and beliefs uh, drive all decisions? Uh, are there exceptions or qualifications? And if so, are they really values? Are they those non-negotiables that we adhere to? And usually these questions can only come when, when you're tested. And, and frankly, they should never really be addressed uh, in the context of a, of a live case. If, that, if you're answering, and then answering those types of questions, then you've got some issues. And that brings me to really my final point, and I wanna uh, be quiet and hear a little bit from uh, Liz and Jeff, but uh, in using transparency as sort of an example, I often push organizations to tell me what they mean uh, when they say that they're committed to transparency. Is that transparency in all things? Does that mean in a particular case, does that mean that uh, a physician's prior uh, history of complications, uh, errors, other issues, that that's going to be disclosed to the patient? Uh, does it also mean that there are uh, circumstances that are really possibly tangential or outside the context of the patient care delivery need to be presented to the, to the patient? These are real world questions that are legitimate. 
And as part of your organizational philosophy, they have to be addressed. And what it typically means is that you have to sit down and take time to figure out what do I mean when I say that I want to be transparent? How does that look in real time? And test it out. Work with patient advocates, work with your internal staff to make sure that, that you're achieving a, a common goal that the organization uh, uh, hopes to accomplish. So those are a few points that uh, I thought I'd leave you with, but I'll stop here and I'll turn it over to Jeff and Liz. Thank you, Wes. That was so helpful. Um, and just the complexity of what transparency can mean. And um, we really appreciate your thoughts. Liz, one of the integral aspects of a successful CRP is the ability to create a balance of expectations between plaintiff and defense counsels. I would love your thoughts on the challenges of doing this, as well as pearls that might be able to help. Thank you, Caitlin. Again, I'm happy to be here today. I've been working with the collaborative uh, for what seems like a very long time, but we have really begun to see some uh, fruits of our, our labors and it's really very gratifying. I'm also happy to be here with Wes and Jeff and you know, wonderful uh, to collaborate with. I wanted to follow up on something that Wes said about the culture of transparency because it affects, I think, the expectations of both plaintiff's counsel and defense counsel. Um, hospitals, at least in my experience, uh, since the mid to early 80s, are not ha do not have a history of transparency. We don't have a history of being uh, very forthcoming on some of these uh, issues. Instead, we have actually the opposite history. A lot of our discussions about these issues are shrouded in peer review, quality assurance, et cetera. They are uh, kept confidential rather than even shared within the um, organization itself. So I think that history affects the expectations of the council and parties going into um, the CRP programs. So I wanted to start with the expectations of the plaintiff's counsel. And I know, uh, Jeff, you could probably speak better than I on this, but I'm going to uh, uh, address this through um, the eyes of having known many plaintiff's counsel as adversaries and friends over the past uh, 30 plus years. Uh, their expectations on a CRP um, process are largely formed by the history uh, that they've had with that institution. And in many cases, it's a history of distrust. So in our jurisdiction, medical malpractice cases are hotly contested. Uh, of, of all the civil cases, they're the ones most likely to go to trial. And we try a lot of them. And so there's uh, medical malpractice cases in our jurisdiction are very, very expensive. They're lengthy, they're hard fought. So the plaintiff's attorneys are like, why now are they coming to me wanting to work through and resolve this issue? Why now I've been fighting them my entire career, having to go to trial uh, on behalf of my clients. Then their second, uh, I think, expectation is, well, they're just trying to use this as a way to get out cheaply, to settle the case for less money than they would otherwise have to pay. So they, that's one of their um, thoughts and expectations on the process. Another expectation is, well, the hospital is hiding something if they weren't hiding something from me, they wouldn't be so interested in uh, trying to resolve and settle this matter early. So there must be something uh, in the background that, that we're not being told. And if we knew that something, the value of our case would be higher. Um, and then um, finally, the, the another uh, thought that some of the plaintiff's attorneys have expressed to me is, well, this is just a uh, preview. They just want to see our cards on the case. They want to see what our case is about. And they're going to stonewall us and go to lawsuit and fight us just like they always do anyways. So why should I participate in this particular program? So that's kind of the plaintiff attorney perspective. And I look forward to Jeff telling me uh, if I'm wrong, but at least that's uh, where we've been um, in the past uh, five to six years. Uh, then, then there's the defense side. Now, I do know that a little better, having uh, been on that side um, all of my career. So on the defense side, we're expecting, okay, this communication resolution process, we're going to get to a quick resolution of this lawsuit. This is not going to take a lot of time and effort on my part. 
Uh, this case will be wrapped up with limited involvement by me. So that's one expectation is that it's going to be more like a, a claim adjustment with the hospital and not necessarily a lawyer involved thing. And as I'll t explain later, it actually has become somewhat uh, more lawyer intensive than, than we would have thought. Then the other concern of defense counsel is that, well, all this transparency, okay, everyone's all transparent. They're writing these letters, falling on their swords, saying all these things were done wrong. The plaintiffs aren't going to settle this case. And then all those letters are going to be thrown up on the board for the jury to see and the value of the case is going to go up and I'm going to have to defend this thing that they just basically handed um, all of our strategies and, and ideas and admissions to the other side. So that's part of the expectation on the defense side. I mean, some of us are wary as well about disclosure because it may end up being in court. So those are some of the difficulties and barriers we've had in terms of expectations. So in terms of how to address and look at the, these expectations, I think it is going to take time and experience with the CRP for those expectations to um, dissolve and, and to fully understand and appreciate the promise that programs like this have. Um, we have uh, done, tried to do, a good, uh, to spread the word of very, various successful cases, including one I did myself where the, um, the physician paid policy limits in a CRP process prior to the suit being filed. So it wasn't a matter of trying to get out cheaply. Uh, it was a matter of trying to resolve the case early so that the party's resources didn't get spent on litigation and could instead be spent uh, taking care of the family. I think it also is important um, that the counsel who are chosen to participate in this, maybe on both sides, have a reputation for uh, not hiding the ball in discovery, for being people who can um, work together uh, on a case. So if you get somebody who's known to be straightforward and upfront, that person is going to do a lot uh, better to shape the expectations of the lawyers on the other side. And then finally, I think another strategy would be to involve a mediator, a third party uh, in, in some disputes. Often, you know, it, it does come down to a, a monetary settlement and how much is the correct amount. Uh, that can also be um, assisted with the use of a, a mediator or, or third party. So those are some of the things that we've been doing, but you know the expectations on both sides are still pretty um, pretty well cemented. So we have a lot of work to do to uh, wear those down through the positive experiences. Thank you, Liz. Um, I especially appreciate your thoughts on the pearls and how to move the process forward. Um, Jeff, we have been discussing the need to approach CRPs through a lens of transparency and discussion rather than as an adversarial process. Would you be able to share with us your experience with the Massachusetts Alliance for Communication Resolution following medical injury, including lessons learned and successes in moving the process forward? Absolutely, and I wanna start off by saying um, that it's a pleasure and honor to be part of this discussion because, um, and excuse my casual attire, I'm on vacation with my family, but I felt this was really important and I really enjoyed talking about it and being part of, a small part of any process that is designed to increase transparency following medical errors. Um, and so, you know, starting off, uh, what does it mean to be transparent? Uh, so the organization I'm a part of called the Massachusetts Alliance for Communication and Resolution Following Medical Injury, otherwise called MACRAMI for short, has been in existence for about 10 years, currently being absorbed by the Betsy Lehman Center. Um, I will tell you in that 10 year period, since I was, have been on this committee, I am seeing a sea change. Um, you know, it's encouraging to see a bright light in this world where there's so much division so much ingrained hostility by adversarial parties. And I, I'm happy to report that at least um, what, what I'm seeing is a glimmer of hope within the medical profession as between patients and their attorneys and organizations such as Macrame and the collaborative really putting sort of um, the meat on the bones of what does it mean to be transparent. Macrame uh, has board members that include very eclectic group, including hospitals, insurers, the Massachusetts Bar Association, which I represent, the Mass Medical Society, and a nonprofit safety group. 
Um, we have a program called CARE, which is short for Communication, Apology, and Resolution. Uh, very organized. They um, have a specific set of algorithms that they ask participating hospitals to follow to ensure that the process is organized. Um, and in addition to that, uh, when something, and this is, I think, a very distinctive aspect of macrame, when something unfortunate or tragic happens to a patient or a patient's family member, um, they, uh, they provide a list of attorneys uh, to the patient uh, or the family member. And these are attorneys who subscribe to the concept um, of doing this early transparency resolution process. And as, and as Liz mentioned, and, and again, it's just such a pleasure to follow Liz and Wes because they touch on so many important points and I'm excited to add to some of those. Um, but as Liz mentioned, this can go sideways um, in the minds of some attorneys. And so this list of patients is one that we've carefully vetted They've, they've watched a, a program on what it means to be part of the care process, and they're open to flexible fee arrangements. In other words, in Massachusetts, we are statutorily prohibited from charging any more than certain amounts. But here with Macrame, if the resolution is faster or for smaller amounts, which happens a lot, we do encourage everybody on this list of pay, uh, uh, this attorney list it subscribes to a more flexible fee arrangement. And my role on this committee um, has been, um, after having represented patients for over 20 years, having started out representing uh, physicians and, and healthcare providers, um, is to ensure that uh, patient rights are protected. Um, I'm very, very committed to that. Um, and, you know, what does that mean? Uh, and how does this work in order to ensure that the patient's rights are protected? And, you know, initially, the first thing is that you have to advise uh, the patient or the family of the patient uh, to get attorney, to get counsel early in the process, early in the process. And it's nothing different than any of us in this um, discussion group would expect if a family member, say your mother or your sister, uh, called you from another state or something and said, I, they want to meet with me to talk about what happened and why such an unfortunate, tragic result happened. You might want to, you're, instinctively, you might say it might be important to have a lawyer present. And another reason for that though, it, it, it's, it's about the power differential that exists between the patient and the hospital. I mean, imagine, you know, all of us are familiar with hospital settings. We're all familiar with the medical malpractice process in some way, shape or form. We're comfortable more or less in that environment. If you are a patient who has suffered a medical injury, especially a devastating one, or, or whose family member suffered a devastating injury, there are myriad emotions that are swimming about right? It's anger, it's frustration, it's confusion, it's, it's, it's distress, it, you, it's anxiety. And all of these things are potentially getting in the way of any family member's ability to process um, what is being told to them, what is being discussed. And so in order to ensure that that power differential is equalized, it's really important for a lawyer to be present. And that has been my role uh, in attending these meetings. Additionally, later on, if there is a settlement, of course, then you have to talk about a release that has to be signed, which is full of a lot of legal mumbo jumbo, but important stuff that a patient who's not a lawyer would probably not appreciate the significance of, such, such as confidentiality, liens, medical liens need to be negotiated. So that needs to be a concept that's very important early on for people to truly buy into what does it mean to be transparent to answer Wes's question. And the other thing is to, you have to approach this with the shared goal of improving patient safety. I cannot tell you how many times people have come to me when a family member has died. And if they said to me, my family member died, how much can I get? I would say, for me, nothing. I don't want your case. They don't come to me like that though. They've in 20, over 20 years of representing patients, they say to me, my family member is got harmed or died. I don't want this to happen to someone else. And I think everybody in that room, when there is such a meeting, shares that concept. They share that, that very fundamental desire to make sure this doesn't happen to someone else. And that's the idea of opening dialogue so that systemic changes can be made. Um, and I'm very impressed to say, and proud to say that Macrame has been very invested in this concept and very receptive to my input. And so in a uh, couple of minutes I have remaining before I turn it over back to Caitlin, um, what has worked, what has shown that this is ethos to use uh, Wes's excellent term and not just pathos? Um, well, first of all, um, if you recognize that you're not there to be adversarial, right? You're there to improve patient safety. The physicians, the, the risk managers, the insurance companies all should share that. 
And, and additionally, um, you know, what I've seen work is when everybody uh, appreciates certain very specific things. The meeting as much as possible should be in person. Um, it's, the healthcare providers involved should try to be there. Um, a patient should be invited to have a support person and yes, a lawyer. It's best if it takes place in a conference room, Zoom can be effective, but maybe not as much oftentimes. Recognize and listen to what the patient is saying. Keep taking into consideration all those myriad emotions that I was discussing. Make the apology, but let it make sure it's sincere. Make sure it comes from the heart of the designated individual. Maybe it's the provider. And in Massachusetts, that can be kept confidential pursuant to language that we inserted into a legislation years ago that I worked on. Let the patient and family take notes and hope that the patient has retained an attorney with a lot of experience. As Liz said, you want someone who's not only won cases, but lost cases, because you know they're the ones who can appropriately advise a patient as to whether to pursue something or not pursue something. And hopefully that, that brings an educated perspective to the whole experience from the plaintiff's perspective. It's important for that attorney to have a pre-meeting with the family to understand what do you want to get out of this? What's important? What questions do you need to know? And then when the meeting happens, the attorney is best, I think, in my experience, the best role fulfilled there is to listen and facilitate dialogue, not to cross-examine, not to become adversarial, because instinctively everybody will shut up and then you're not gonna get any transparency. Also, the attorney has to break down the language. Um, no offense to you, very bright doctors who are present and healthcare providers, you speak a different language than the rest of the world. And it's common for you to use language that you think is so intuitive and so understandable, but it's really not, especially to so many people who may not have the education level uh, that's near to the uh, education level you all have. I mean, it helps if a defense attorney is present and partners with the plaintiff's attorney to make this happen. Um, in a short way, I can, should I talk, Caitlin, about the negative things or what, what doesn't work? Absolutely, please. Yeah, yes. I'm a little bit of time, I'm sorry, but I think this is- we, we have time. We're gonna move the, the schedule around, so please do. Okay, all right. What doesn't work? When I mean, physicians and healthcare providers don't show up at a meeting and instead it's a hospital representative only. Can it still happen? Can it be beneficial? Yes, as much as if the doctor or nurse is there and shows their investment in, what, in the harm that happened. No, so the doctor, nurses, whoever's invested, hopefully will show up. Um, what does not work, and one time I was asked to leave the room. I was an attorney, I was representing, for all those reasons I mentioned earlier, the family wanted me present. And then the risk manager said, we're not gonna talk unless Jeff leaves the room, leave the room. So I left the room, because I didn't wanna inhibit dialogue, which was a silly thing, because the family's gonna tell me what all was discussed, and all that happened was they were more angry and frustrated that the person they invited was told, you can't be here. So that is a bad idea. Um, in Massachusetts, what, what makes it difficult sometimes is that the insurance companies make the final call, right? So the hospital may, and the healthcare providers may say, boy, we screwed up, we feel so bad, we wanna make amends, but they're not picking up the tab. It's the insurance companies, at least in Massachusetts. I'm not sure how, some places are self-insured, like in Michigan. The University of Michigan system works very well because it is self-insured, not in Massachusetts. So that can add delay sometimes. It can also add frustration and loss of goodwill that was generated at the initial meeting if this drags on and it has happened where it drags on for over a year and the family's like, I don't get it. They admit the mistake, what's the delay? And also too, you know, if the, if the um, plaintiff's attorney gets too greedy, I mean, this is a process where you're recognizing you're selling a case now to avoid protracted lengthy litigation that only adds to the anxiety of the patient and to the, of the doctor. And so the last thing is, and I don't have to say much about this because Liz covered it so well, um, not all defense attorneys and plaintiff's attorneys are on board every time. She mentioned um, how plaintiff's attorneys think that the hospital is hiding something, um, a wolf in sheep's clothing. There's plenty of plaintiff's attorneys who are always going to think that, and it's hard to disabuse them of that. Um, some attorneys may want to participate aggressively. I don't think that's a good idea, but I've seen and heard that happen. And then defense attorneys, in addition to the things that uh, Liz mentioned, there is the fact that if they settled early, it's less of a billable opportunity. And you would hope that most defense attorneys would recognize that's not their role. The really good ones, the really successful ones don't need this case in order to make a living. And if they recognize it's true harm, then they're too invested in the process. But again, as with a young or inexperienced plaintiff's attorney, a young or inexperienced defense attorney can muck up the process because they'd rather have the case and bill it out for a couple of years, which moots the whole purpose of this program. So I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but I hope that covered most of what you were looking for, Caitlin. That was perfect, Jeff, thank you. And it was a really beautiful transition to the second portion of this webinar, um, focused on, on barriers to CRPs 
as well as creative ways in which those those barriers could um, be addressed. And so I appreciate your thoughts um, on what works well, and then also what what really does not work well. Um, in our CRP process. Thank you. Um, Liz, I would now love to turn to you um, and your experience as defense counsel um, with CRPs and your thoughts on sort of ensuring equal representation as Jeff was talking about um, sort of challenges brought up by uh, suggestions he made and sort of ways forward from that. Uh, thank you, um, Caitlin. And um, my uh, career has been devoted to supporting healthcare providers through the process of a medical error, whether it's a settlement, a lawsuit, or however the matter, or a trial, however it resolves. So it's been interesting to really fully appreciate the uh, second victim, if you will, effect on the providers of having caused harm to one of their patients. And the, um, the profound uh, sort of uh, emotional trauma that goes along with that and they all have varying you know responses to it some become defensive and don't want to talk about it others uh become quite uh sad and remorseful and need support others they all question going forward what am i going to do next and um, the important thing though i think about crps as it pertains to the provider is to not be punitive so for example um, I have helped uh, providers through the process dealing with the various disciplinary boards after the resolution has been reached. So in Washington, we have a CRP certification process. Um, typically, that's done by hospitals. Let me give you an example of the kind of case that's certified. So we had a, a patient who had surgery. The patient was going to be taken, <clears throat> excuse me, to the recovery room on oxygen, and the resident forgot to hook the oxygen up on the transport. So obviously, you know, an adverse uh, result. The attending physician, even though he was not present, took full responsibility. There was a big uh, root cause analysis. A lot of system changes and trainings were done. But in the end, there was a significant settlement reported to our disciplinary board on behalf of the attending physician. And we were able to take it through our certification process where this panel of hospital administrators, uh, physicians, pharmacists, nurses, um, lawyers, uh, uh, all different types of people, you submit a uh, form that you fill out about all the steps you've taken consistent with the CRP process and the steps you've taken to fix the problem so that it wouldn't happen again. And then the panel, if it certifies that as a CRP event, the disciplinary board takes that into account in determining whether or not the provider will be disciplined. Is our disciplinary board has a, a sanction tier that they have to follow depending on patient harm. So having a CRP certified event really removes some of the punitive aspects and negative effects on the physician's career. I mean, in this attending, obviously wasn't even there when this happened, did take responsibility, uh, but was able to not be sanctioned uh, by the disciplinary board uh, for that. And then we also did one involving a um, error of medication. The patient was given um, lidocaine instead of bicarb during the surgery. Just the bottles looked the same, et cetera. So that same process was uh, pursued. It was certified. And the uh, physician involved against whom a significant settlement had been reported was able to continue to practice. And this was the single event in um, her career was able to continue to practice well and without the punitive aspect of the disciplinary board coming down upon her and the crp process was very valuable in that in that way i've also had experience uh, with it when we've discovered a big error like for example we had a um, large inadvertent disposal of frozen embryos. Believe it or not, this is, is a big problem uh, with retained embryos. In any event, we had to do a disclosure to all the different patients who are affected, deal with the different circumstances. And fortunately, we're able to get all those resolved without any 
um, lawsuits, you know, we were able to get it all resolved through the uh, CRP process and, and fix the, the problem internally as well. So my experience has been primarily with what I call the, let me back up a minute, cases are sort of black, white, or gray. So black cases on the defense side would be ones in which there is a clear error that clearly caused harm. White cases might be ones which are defensible. There was, you know, good care, unfortunate result that was not due to negligence. The gray area cases are kind of those in between that could be argued either way. I have not uh, done many of those in the CRP process, and I think those are going to be the challenge uh, for CRPs going forward because they involve a compromise on both sides. Uh, so I think that the, the case selection. Uh, for us, at least in our experience, it was easier to deal with the cases of clear error and address those as, as we're learning and implementing our CRP process. Um, I agree completely with Jeff about getting a list of lawyers is absolutely critical. The difficulties and barriers that we've sustained are that some of the cases are very small. And in our jurisdiction, the attorneys get paid by a percentage uh, not unusual, and a, a percentage of a small award is not much and may not even cover the attorney's time spent in working on the CRP. So we're trying to figure out a way to get through that. One of the um, ideas that we've had is to perhaps recruit a panel of volunteer attorneys who'd be willing to do it for a lesser fee. A lot of people want to get, young attorneys want to get experience uh, as well, and um, the opportunities to do that are more infrequent as fewer cases go to trial, uh, and they have fewer opportunities as young lawyers to interact with clients. So that's one of our barriers that we're trying to work hard on, and it sounds like Jeff's gotten a head start on us in terms of getting attorneys uh, who are willing to uh, participate in that. And fortunately, we haven't had any problem with the most of the defense attorneys on um, our in our group, I have plenty of cases, and so we haven't had the problem of uh, people wanting to prolong the case just to uh, build a file. So, uh, and we do have in our state, we have a um, in, uh, voluntary arbitration for uh, statute for claims under a million dollars, but it is, um, in my opinion, grossly underutilized by the plaintiff's bar. For some reason, they don't like that, and it's a much easier way and less expensive way for cases, smaller cases, to get uh, adjudicated. Uh, so we have that, but we just, we have a real gap for the small cases and I'm hoping we can find some good ways to fill that. So thanks. Thank you, Liz. That was fantastic. It's so interesting to hear about the process in Washington and in Massachusetts. And Jeff, now I'd like to just turn to you quickly before I, I turn to, to Wes um, to answer a really specific question that, that Liz brought up, which is the challenges with these small cases. And have you encountered that in Washington, in Massachusetts? And how have you dealt with that? Uh, sure. So I've successfully resolved uh, a bunch of cases through this care process. Um, and I will tell you that um, not all of them result in substantial compensation or any compensation at all. Um, the ones are insubstantial, let's say, we'll call that under $100,000. Um, typically, it would be hard for any plaintiff's lawyer to decide that that's a case worth investing in, especially if you're going to have to acknowledge that if you can resolve the case with a meeting and a few discussions with the hospital or its representative, uh, that maybe you don't really shouldn't be justified in taking a third of that or whatever the case may be. Um, I will tell you, the people on the list here in Massachusetts are folks that want to do it anyway because it gives some representation to people and uh, they agree to reduce their fee. I've done, I've settled uh, a case through this program for as little as $40,000 and then I reduced my fee to the hourly rate that it took for me to accomplish that resolution for her. Um, and she was thrilled and the hospital was good about it. It, it wasn't a tragic error, thankfully. Um, and it was just something that um, lawyers who do this, not just to make money, but to improve patient safety um, can buy into. Um, again, it's not gonna make or break your year to settle a case for 40,000, but it's, and then take a small fee of that, but, but it does feel good. Uh, and hopefully you can get some lawyers who subscribe to that same kind of concept. The more challenging thing is in circumstances where there's no compensation offered. And then the attorney has to help the patient process that. Um, because now, you know, they don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that this is no one's fault, right? And so 
if there's true transparency, it doesn't always result in, and so we want to offer you some money. Sometimes it's, we've looked at it, and so we've determined that this really isn't the result of negligence or anyone's error. And a good lawyer is going to process that and wonder, is that sufficient or is it not? Do we have to go to sue? Um, but it can often be the case that people who are not provided compensation, even though transparency took place, or even more challenging where a mistake occurred, but it really didn't cause substantial harm, um, those are difficult cases to help a patient uh, kind of process. But you do hope this too, as another pitch, to get lawyers involved when the fee, the compensation may in fact be small sometimes. You're hoping to make systemic improvements, right? You're not just doing it, hopefully, because it feels good to help that person, but also because you're thinking and hoping that it's making a systemic improvement because it's encouraging transparency, it's allowing for changes to take place. And I settled a case involving a delayed diagnosis because the gentleman elderly had a brain aneurysm, but also a suspicious lung finding. They heroically took care of the brain aneurysm and saved his life. And then nobody thought to inform him or his invested son or anyone else about this suspicious finding. Turned out it was lung cancer. He went back a year later, more symptomatic. They discovered it. Then he died a month after the diagnosis. So a one-year delay. And um, the hospital handled it beautifully. There was a meeting that took place amongst everybody. And then they talked very openly about the systemic change that they made. And that was a very um, inspiring example of how this process can work um, when everybody's invested. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and that is a, a really great transition point, Wes, to turn back to you. Um, and I would love your thoughts um, from your experience on regulatory borders, uh, barriers, excuse me, sort of systemic changes um, that could be used to further support CRPs, increase representation through the process. Uh, it, that's a great question, Caitlin, and, uh, and thank you. And, you know, as I'm kind of processing a little bit of hearing Jeff and Liz talk about it. I mean, in some respects, because what I much of what I do is kind of working behind the scenes, mostly with the safety and quality side of the house, uh, kind of organizing their processes, helping them kind of figure out how to navigate their peer review process, root cause processes to to figure out exactly what happened after a medical error. You know, what we've seen or what I've seen is that when the CRP process works well everybody truly wins in this. Uh, you know, the, the patient has a sense of understanding and completeness and there's a kind of a, a repair of the relationship that entered into, uh, you know, under very difficult circumstances and were made worse and you're always trying to repair it. But then you've also got on the, on the hospital side of it, primarily you've got, you know, counsel trying to navigate through very complex issues about liability and responsibility so that there can be adequate representation. You know, and, and as I look at my role, as sort of a, a regulatory attorney, you know, my job is to create as much of a, a, a conducive environment so that I can get a Jeff and a Liz in the room to, to make things right at the end. So again, mine's sort of self-respect, uh, uh, respect, uh, uh, reflective and trying to figure out what can I do to make this process even better and make it work. And, and some of that is philosophical, kind of like what I talked about at the beginning. Just understanding, you know, the words that you use and the the how you communicate to to patients, how you communicate in house what your what your uh, your values are and how to implement those, and and that's a very thoughtful part of the process. But there was another part that, uh, listening to to Liz and Jeff, that that really struck me. You know, that part of the goal, of course, with you want good representation, you want two good counsel that are coming in there and having an open mind, and trying to resolve a very difficult circumstance, but. The adversarial aspect, believe it or not, can often happen in-house just as much as outside. And, you know, this is something that for, for years and years in working with hospitals, academic medical centers, and health systems, it's interesting how you can see certain uh, philosophies develop independently within the same house. And, and I'll just speak just from my experience, but for example, when a, when a medical error happens in the, on the safety and quality side, you know, typically you know, there's a, a real uh, desire and push to say, you know, we need to make this right with the patient, we need to fix this and do this. And, you know, there's a plan that, that goes forward that's very pro plaintiff or very uh, pro patient in trying to get this in front of the patient to have a dialogue, to have a conversation, and they want to get that started now. But then you've got some tension in the house to say, well, well, wait, you know, let, let's, we want to do that. And there's no disagreement about uh, assisting the patient, but then there's this thoughtful approach to say, well, wait a minute, we've got certain duties and responsibilities. 
You know, for example, some hospitals participate in the patient safety organization program, and that limits certain communications, meaning that it's going to be confidential under federal law, and they won't be able to share this. Or, for example, there might be peer review responsibilities, and there might be different perspectives within the facility as to how this gets communicated. So, uh, in my view, a lot of this, uh, you know, if, if our goal is to make CRP productive, and, and to get people invested in the program with a sense of trust in it, there still has to be a lot of responsibility behind the scenes by the facility to work some of this out. And a lot of times it means getting legal counsel, risk and quality, all sitting down at the table with administration overseeing it and saying, let's work this together so that we can sort out what we're gonna say, how we're gonna say it. So that we don't get into these broad pronouncements of, of and you know, this is my uh, nightmare scenario, scenario in some respects, of a hospital going out and saying, we are completely and utterly transparent on the one hand, which is a phenomenal, great thing to say. But then when the patient walks in the room and they're getting ready to talk about a medical error, they're saying, well, we're going to tell you about this, but we can't because of, we can't tell you about these things because of X, Y, and Z. And then you've got these two messages that have been communicated. We're completely transparent, but we're also not going to be, we're going to be situationally, situationally transparent in these particular cases and for these particular reasons. So the goal, I think, is to think through these issues at the forefront, to, to role play a little bit, to, to test them, to figure out exactly what you mean. When you say transparent, do you mean clinically transparent? We're going to share everything about your care course that you're entitled to know, not only for what happened, but how you get ongoing treatment. Think through those things and articulate them clearly. And if there are limits to what you can't share, then you need to be able to articulate that persuasively, accurately, with legal support that you can have, uh, that you can have available. But these are things, again, this is a point that I made at the beginning. These are points that are, should never be made, decisions never be made in the context of a case. They require that type of training, testing, and practice before you get to that level. And to me, I think that's one of the obstacles that to get uh, Jeff and Liz in a room and, and working these things out, hospitals, health systems, healthcare providers have to do the hard work on the front end to make sure that that pathway makes it easier for resolving these things on the back end. Thank you, Wes. Um, that was a fantastic conclusion to this webinar. And I'm sorry that it is um, at its end because it has been such a great conversation. Um, a huge thank you to Liz, Wes, and Jeff for sharing your experiences and your wisdom. Thank you also for everyone who joined us today. In the last hour, we've discussed the importance of building trust through understanding the varying perspectives of plaintiff defense, institutional stakeholders, and communication and resolution programs, explored strategies to ensure legal representation um, and CRPs, and delved into the need to really create an institutional culture of transparency and, and even more than that, what that actually means. As mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, today is the second in a four-part series brought to you by the Collaborative uh, Attorney Alliance, a recording of the initial January webinar, which featured a panel of physicians who discussed their experiences with medical malpractice, as well as the benefits of peer support, is available on the Collaborative website. On March 17th, I'll be honored, um, we all will be honored, to welcome Dr. Jeff Goldenberg and Naomi Kirtner founders of Talia's Voice, who will really provide powerful insight into the impact of malpractice litigation on patients and families who have been harmed by medical error and how the system can do better. Um, and finally, on April 26th, the series will culminate in a webinar in which all stakeholders in the malpractice process join together for a conversation. It will be focused on breaking down the silos that can form and discussing ways in which communication and resolution programs can improve the process that follows after medical harm for all parties involved. We hope you'll be able to join us for the entirety of, these mini, of this mini series. And now I wanna turn over to Nicole for any questions that have come in from the audience. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for all our speakers. Um, we did have one question come in um, from Linda Kenny. Um, and Jeff, this came in while you were speaking about um, plaintiff attorneys and kind of determining compensation. And Linda wants to know, like, shouldn't patients, um, shouldn't these also be what the patient wants? So maybe you could shed some light about how you how to have these conversations on kind of payment with the patients. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think the first step um, is to, uh, and I'm pleased it's Linda. Linda is a wonderful person who's done so much in this arena, as many of you may know, in terms of recognizing second, second victims, which are doctors, in addition to the patients. And I, I respect her tremendous dedication to this arena. And her question's a good one. Um, in terms of compensation, yes, the patient should be open. We all should be open to the idea that when there's a, a, an adversary, an adverse event that is the result of malpractice, that compensation needs to be part of the, the discussion. Now, it doesn't happen at this initial meeting. That seems a little um, maybe inappropriate or awkward to raise at that time, especially if the participants don't have the authority to so-called make cut a check or you know, so to speak. But that's a conversation where the lawyer again has with the defense attorney afterward, and then there's a series of negotiations back and forth. And hopefully that will ultimately result in appropriate compensation. And I want to emphasize one other point, which is that, you know, as a motivating factor in these meetings, keep in mind, it is really the patient's right to know what happened to her body or his body. And you can only imagine you're under anesthesia, the operative note, the discharge summary, that doesn't explain what happened. And if it's your body and something happened and other people know why and how it happened, there should be no greater motivating force and being transparent than that, because it could be any of us, I hate to say, who are in that position or our family members, and you'd want to make sure that you got all the information you possibly could. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we did have one additional question come in, and Liz, it came up uh, while you were speaking around CRP certification. So a question from Kathleen. Does the CRP certification apply solely to providers, or are organizations able to employ it and show corrective actions and lessons learned? I think it depends on your program. Right now, ours has been uh, focused on providers. I think it would be a great idea to expand it to facilities. And ours really came about because one of our big CRP proponents internally was also a member of the Washington uh, Medical Commission. And so he understood that side of the process. He understood the collaborative's goals. And he's also a physician who had you know, been an expert and participated in the litigation process in that way. So he was really instrumental in bringing the agency and the, um, the commission together with the hospitals, with the collaborative to, um, at least from the provider perspective, provide this avenue for certification rather than immediate, you know, punitive action. Thank you. Um, looks like that was all of the questions we had today. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending and a special thank you to our speakers for sharing their time and wisdom with us today. Um, please look out for an email from the collaborative. Um, we'll include a registration for the next um, March webinar, as well as links to our YouTube channel so you can share the recordings um, with your colleagues. So thanks, everyone, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.